there, Bob from Oregon's Constant Gardener. Welcome to the OCG Fam Show to you, my YouTube buddies. What's going on? Let me know in the comments. So today I'm finally getting to the Dr. Mike Amaranthus and Jeff Lowenfels videos from Green Room Live. I'm sorry it took me so long. I was uh, I was remiss, and I'm sorry. So what we got going on is the first one today is going to be Dr. Mike Amaranthus, who is an internationally known expert in the field of mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, you should probably watch this one first. You've probably heard of Jeff Lowenfels, uh, who wrote the, the books Teeming with Microbes and all those. Uh, probably a bigger figure in the industry, but uh, Dr. Mike uh, really knows his stuff with this uh, mycorrhizal fungi. He's kind of the one that uh, pioneered this field. So. This one and the other one with Jeff Lowenfels kind of work together with each other. So watch this one first and uh, let me know what you think. And then uh, we'll get the other one out tomorrow or the next day. I love you. I'll talk to you soon. Watch the video. So uh, welcome. Um, I was going to start by having you imagine your favorite plant, whatever it might be. Um, <laughs> so uh, if it could be a flower, garden vegetable, cannabis, tree, whatever your favorite plant is, I want you to, um, just for a second, close your eyes and see your plant. Okay, whatever your favorite plant is. Got your eyes closed, looking at your plant. Okay, so how many people are seeing the root system of their plant? <laughs> so, that's what we're gonna focus on today is what's going on below the soil surface. We're gonna look at kind of the end seed part of the plant below the soil surface. So in this case, you can see a little tree grown in a glass box. And here's the roots. And these swollen root tips are the mycorrhiza. And then these fine filaments are the mycorrhizal fungus, which emanate from the root system into the stratum soil. And you can see what a tremendous amount of sort of the roots of the roots, the soil volume that these threads represent in the soil. And that's, that's this mutually beneficial, specialized relationship between the soil fungi and the roots of a certain plant. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship. The plant gets the expanded network of absorption ability and in return the, the tree or the cannabis or whatever the plant is provides the sugars for the growth of the fungus. So we're going to talk about the roots of successful growth. So you're probably thinking, this doesn't sound so exciting. Uh, this is an actual photo of people that saw my talk in China 30 years ago. <laughs> And I wasn't quite sure if I had too much data in there, too many graphs, too much scientific jargon. And then I realized the fact was that none of them spoke English and I, they all spoke Chinese. I gave the talk in English, but uh, um, I don't have a lot of uh, graphs and figures. But if you do want more research, there's a tremendous amount of research available. And I know the guys at uh, Bigfoot Mycorrhiza, I gave them all the published studies. Oh, Jesus. There's actually... Sorry. Have we already started? Yeah, we already started. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, are you, are you taping it? No, no, we're not taping. You're good to go. We just wanted to make sure they could all hear you. So okay. we got the microphone okay. up here. <laughs> Welcome uh, to Green Room Live. Sorry. <laughs> Is it on? Uh, as far as I know. I think I'm on. <laughs> I don't hear it. <laughs> well, try your. Just did you got your? Yeah, I got it. Is it? Do you hear them from the thing? Is it working? Did I turn it up? Can you hear me? Okay. It's not enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Good to go. Okay. Sorry. I'll, no just, I'll just go away. As you were. But anyway, there's there's really over a hundred thousand studies of mycorrhizal fungi. It's by far the most researched aspect of soil biology. So if you ever want specific information on a specific to topic, we can get it for you. I've got all that. I've been working with mycorrhiza for a long time. In fact, I started back back in the 70s working on mycorrhiza with the USDA um, at Oregon State University. And then what we really found was, and a lot of this work hadn't been done, it was nobody really knew, we knew about a little bit about mycorrhiza, but not the effects of disturbance. We figured out that the more BTUs you unload on the soil, the more likely you were to lose mycorrhizal fungi. 
and we also figured out how to add mycorrhizal fungi back to plant systems to get the relationship going. And then about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we started a company called Mycorrhizal Applications in Grants Pass, and we're producing a couple million pounds of mycorrhizae a year now. It's getting shipped all over the world. So I sold the company a couple years ago. The company's doing great without me, not surprisingly, but. Uh, it's, it's going great. Mycorrhizal fungi are getting out there. So, But we had to determine early on in the, this whole mycorrhizal business is that, you know, which types do you use? How much inoculum do you need? Um, you know, what are the situations in terms of best timing to apply the mycorrhiza? And then what kind of practices are compatible? What are good things to mix mycorrhizae with? Which <coughs> kind of products can you use? What kind of fertilizers? What kind of pesticides? I mean, none of that was worked out at the time. So <coughs> over the last 30, 40 years, a lot of those details have been worked out. And, and now we've got this comprehensive uh, monitoring system. Can you guys see OK? Or is that speaker? Yeah. Um, you know, we've done, spent, last year we spent almost $3 million just in field trials on mycorrhiza all over the world. And it's, it's really, we're getting some great data. And it is working in most cases. So it's kind of exciting to see this infant industry really kind of you know, take off. So again, here's the ceiling in the glass box and you can see the whole relationship. And these are the spores. These are the, the babies of the mycorrhizae, the seeds of the mycorrhizae. And this is what's the active ingredient in the mycorrhizal product. So that's what you're actually putting in into the soil. And we'll talk about how they germinate and grow. So, there's endo and ecto mycorrhiza, which are the primary, there's several types, other types like ericoid mycorrhiza, orchid mycorrhiza, but these are the dominant types. This is endo type, and that's the one that forms with cannabis and it also forms with 80% of the world's plant species. And then there's ecto, which forms primarily with uh, conifers and oaks. So those are the two major types. Uh, they've been around for 460 million years. The ones that are important for cannabis is are what these endomycorrhiza. They're also called arbuscular mycorrhiza. This is a great picture that we took that was published in Science. And this is an arbuscule. Arbuscule literally means little tree. And this is within the cortical cell of the plant root. And this is where the fungus and the plant exchange materials. That's the arbuscule. And it's called arbuscular mycorrhiza. So I was, I mean, Jeff Lohenfels is going to speak next, he's a fantastic speaker. <clears throat> we both had the same experience. We were both trained very traditionally. I was trained as a soil scientist at UC Berkeley. You know, everything was NPK, you know, cultivate, you know, genetically modify. That was always the way to go. And I, my first job was out at Berkeley was to move up to Southern Oregon. And I had the tree um, seedling production program. And we produced 150 million trees a year. And we had all kinds of problems. These trees, which were normally growing, and these trees that are stunted, were planted the same day. The stunted trees were phosphorus deficient. Yet the soil had overwhelming phosphorus concentrations. The soil, the soil phosphorus concentrations were super high, but the trees were phosphorus deficient. It made no sense, no, no sense to me. So I called all these soil experts, all these plant experts, and they just kept saying the same answer. Add more fertilizer, add more fertilizer, add more fertilizer. So we kept adding, for five years we'd add more fertilizer. The soils got too salty, the soil structure all broke down, we had this huge problem with, with pathogens in the soil. We were over fertilizing, we were ruining the soils. We were spending $70,000 an acre per year on these soils and the trees were crappy. And not only that, they had almost no root systems because we were growing these trees hydroponically. For, for the most part, we were adding so much fertilizer. So after years of struggling with these soils, I, someone told me, well, you need to talk to this guy named Jim Trappy. And he was a, kind of an obscure scientist at Oregon State University. He was a forest mycologist. And so Jim told me, I call him up and I go, God, I have all these problems. He goes, oh, it's a mycorrhizal problem. Go out in the forest, collect these puff balls, these mushrooms, these truffles, put them in a blender, make a liquid, just spray it over the beds, and in two weeks you'll be fine. 
I thought, who the hell is this guy? I've been doing this for five years and I've had no success. So we went out and we collected. He gave me pictures of what to look for. Went out and we collected the stuff, put it in my wife's blender, put it in a 150 gallon tank and we sprayed it over these beds. I went back two weeks later, I could not believe it. Could not believe it. I was totally hooked. I called him up, Jim, I want to be your graduate student. I got to learn more about this. How come I don't know anything about this? We took these kinds of beds with these phosphor deficient trees that we've been battling forever and we turned them into these beds in a couple weeks. It became a national program. All the trees in the Pacific Northwest within three years were inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. It went national. It's a great success story. Jim is still around. Jim is close to 90 years old. He still publishes papers on mycorrhiza. Lives in Corvallis. Great guy. But I was hooked. So I was really, it was really an eye opener for me. And I decided that where we really needed information, sorry about this, is the effects of disturbance. How do we treat soils? This is from some film from the Dust Bowl, but. You, if you look globally, there was a lot, we traveled to Africa, Asia, parts of Europe, all over the world, and we saw all these deteriorated soils. And we wondered, okay, the soils look bad, but really, what is the biology like? And the biology was pretty bad. So the concept was, how do we get these mycorrhizal inoculum or seeds back into the soil where they can form this relationship with roots? So the roots send out an attraction for the mycorrhizae to actually enter the root. They form these arbuscules and these various structures that actually store energy and they transfer materials to the roots. And then you develop this my mycelial network, which is obviously more efficient in terms of absorbing nutrients and water than a non-mycorrhizal plant. So the big thing was to find these catastrophically disturbed sites and get the mycorrhiza reestablished. And so we did studies all over the planet trying to get these mycorrhizae to, to reform. And it turned out one of the most important parts of having mycorrhizae on plants was the fact that many nutrients in the soil were unavailable to the plant. This is calcium phosphate. So this is how phosphorus is locked up in the soil in many cases. And it's actually like a little rock. And what the mycorrhizae do is they produce an enzyme which dissolves the rock to put the phosphorus in solution so the plant can absorb it, or the fungal filament can absorb it and transport it back to the plant. So a lot of iron is really tied up in the soil, manganese, magnesium, some calcium products, and especially phosphorus are really these little rocks in the soil. And the mycorrhiza, only scientists get, established, get excited about petri dishes, I know most people care less. <laughs> but these are actually mycorrhizal colonies. And you see these halo effects is actually where the, the mycorrhiza is producing an enzyme to dissolve the insoluble phosphorus that's in the dish. Well, that's exactly what it does in the soil. Here you've got a non-mycorrhizal plant. Phosphorus is only available in this really narrow depletion zone along the plant root. Well, you've got these vast pools of phosphorus that are unavailable, where the mycorrhiza can grow away from the root, produce enzymes which dissolve phosphorus in these larger pools of the soil. Most soils have tons of phosphorus. It's just not available because the soil is dead. If you put life in your soil, suddenly all that phosphorus in your soil can become available to the plant. Just some time we released photography of the mycorrhizal filaments growing. This was actually used by National Geographic. And you can actually see at one point here, very shortly, the nutrients flowing via the mycorrhizal hyphae back to the plant root. But this network, this dichotomous nature of the mycorrhizal branching into the soil, it's nothing new. Uh, nature's figured this out for hundreds of millions of years. This is the network of a, of a small leaf. This is the network of the human heart. And this is the river network of the Amazon. This dichotomous branching pattern is the way nature accesses, absorbs, and transports material. You see it echo throughout the natural system. And the mycorrhiza really are no different. It's, here's the roots the mycorrhiza and the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. So it was nature's solution to soils to get to access resources and get it back to the plant. And basically what we're trying to do is take sterile soil systems, which by the way never exist in nature. You would never, if this was a native soil 
or an undisturbed soil, you would never find this kind of root system. They just don't exist. Nature provides for this kind of root system, and this is why in natural systems, you don't need to fertilize, you don't need to irrigate, because everything's conserved. There's no loss in these systems where these systems are highly inefficient, and that's why you add, have to add so much fertilizer and water to make these systems productive, because they've lost their network. And most people don't realize that in natural systems, roots have roots. So here's the, the mycorrhiza, the roots, and the mycorrhiza, and here's the mycorrhizal fungus. So that's an ecto, and here's an endo. Again, same kind of system where you've got the roots here, and that's the network. So again, that's the way the natural system works. Unfortunately, in highly disturbed or sterile soils or manufactured soils, you don't have the benefits of having the, the roots for the roots. So the well-published benefits are, you know, enhanced nutrient uptake, drought resistance, enhanced flowering and fruiting, which obviously has a lot of significance for the cannabis industry, improved plant establishment, which can also benefit the cannabis industry, and then, of course, better yields. And again, there's over 100,000 published studies of mycorrhiza. But they're not a panacea. They're not going to help you if you've got spider mites. They don't help with the you know, the kind of pests that you get in the foliage. Um, they don't help if you have other catastrophic problems uh, in your soil, but their part, the soil biology part is often missed from the whole soil health aspect, and people just focus on the chemical and the physical, and the biological is often ignored, and that's becoming, with people like Jeff Lowenfels and, and others that are writing books on the subject, people are much more aware that the biological part of soils is critical to soil health, which influences soil productivity. And as Jeff will talk about in his talk, I mean, it's the best talk ever for this kind of stuff. So he talks about how it affects environmental quality, human health, food quality, all these things that we take for granted that are really linked back to the biological components. So uh, Jeff gives a really powerful talk about how the whole system fits together. Not all plants are mycorrhizal. There are a few groups that aren't like the brassica, cabbage, broccoli, canola, uh, the polygon AC, the buckwheat, the rhubarb, and to my chagrin, my last name is Amaranthus. Amaranthus is the largest non-mycorrhizal family on earth. I have to live with the pain of that. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, beets and spinach are not mycorrhizal. But this connection to flowering is really important. It's a really important role of mycorrhiza because Flowering is so much a phosphorus driven event. So we've done countless experiments over the years. Jeff has a lot of our photographs of field trials um, where we've induced more flowering, bigger flowers, etc. The mycorrhiza really played an important role in that. And again, there's been a lot of studies, you know, N and P acquisition are huge in terms of productivity. Uh, just a plot of potatoes with and without mycorrhiza. You know, we get a lot of 10 to 20 to sometimes even 30 percent increase in yields, and especially on root crops onions, carrots, uh, potatoes, shallots really respond. These are tomatoes. Um, this is no mycorrhiza and no fertilizer on a tomato, it does not grow very well. This is fertilizer only. And here's a fertilizer with mycorrhiza. So in a large way, we've just improved the efficiency of getting the fertilizer into the plant and not have it leach out the bottom of the, of the pot. Not all mycorrhizae are the same in terms of their growth promoting potential. Uh, when we scre start screening mycorrhiza early in the early days uh, to see which would be most effective, we did find a lot of variation. Um, some mycorrhiza did really well under really low fertility conditions, but couldn't hand, handle fertilizer. So when we were searching for different, these are different spores of different arbuscular mycorrhiza, we looked for ones that could handle fertilizer at a moderate level, because some of them couldn't, that you couldn't get them to form with any kind of fertilization. So we did find quite a few species and strains that were quite did quite well under moderate levels of fertility. So 
And they vary in the ability. What's that? Are you talking about synthetic fertilizers or organic fertilizers? Oh, well, e even organic fertilizers at high levels affected some. But definitely the organic fertilizers overall were much better than the synthetic fertilizers. And controlled or slow release fertilizers were better than quick release fertilizers. So that was those were the general trends. But the fungi really varied in their tolerance to fertility. Um, and I think that's you know something that uh, over the last 30 years other researchers have found as well. So we found species we thought were really good. Um, we, we grow like 12 different kinds of mycorrhiza, but for most agricultural situations, most horticultural situations, these are our highest performing species. Glomus intraticis, Glomus mossiae, Glomus aggregatum, and Glomus antibiconum. So um, they give us, you know, the wide, most wide array of benefits at the most cost-effective price range. So, and then we looked at just recent studies. So here are those four fungi, fungi again, four different mycorrhizal fungi. And here's the benefits, whether it be increased crop yield or increased root and enzyme activity, root biomass, increased flower fruiting, all these different benefits, salt tolerance, drought tolerance, whatever. And then here's the number of recent studies in the last seven years that demonstrated the benefits of those various species. So there's a lot of research. The problem is the research is so hard for lay people to read. It's so full of jargon. It's so full of obscure references. It's so full of you know crazy regression equations and graphs and figures that nobody can really figure it out. And the beauty is now we have people like Jeff that are taking this comprehensive data set and making it giving it shape and meaning for people, you know, in a way that it's easy to, for them to absorb. So it's one thing to have all these studies, another way to make, to pass that knowledge on to people that need the information to grow their plants. Uh, this is a, a study by the uh, Bigfoot people, and this is another commercially available mycorrhiza, and this is their four species blend. You can see the difference in root growth on tomato plants. And just somebody asked me, you know, what's the typical kind of yield enhancement we could, you, you can expect. And I, I'd say in the hundred different published studies of our product, and if you looked at the thousands of studies overall in the mycorrhizal literature, you know, you can expect a 10 to 20% increase in production by using mycorrhiza. And you can save some money on inputs, <coughs> like fertilizer and, you know, disease control. So you can save some stuff on inputs, but you know it's not unusual to get a 10 to 20 percent increase in yield and quality. And it helps with plant establishment. We'll go into some detail there. But here's a treated grape plant versus an untreated grape plant, and that's with Glomus and Tyrannosis. But I could show, I literally have thousands of studies side by side. Studies, so I don't want to bore you too much, but if you need more data, a lot of the uh, Bigfoot people have a lot of these pictures on their website and or they've got access to a lot of the studies behind the pictures, but that's alfalfa on the top, treated with mycorrhiza versus alfalfa on the bottom, not treated, side-by-side -side study. This is wheat in Australia, uh, the right with mycorrhiza versus without mycorrhiza. They, they have the inter, the intercrop canola with mycorrhizae and with wheat. Uh, and the, the canola is non-mycorrhizal. So after they grow with canola, they often get this, they call it the mycorrhizal phosphate syndrome over there. And they get a non-mycorrhizal system after canola until they get the mycorrhizae established where on this side of the field, they actually used the mycorrhiza in furrow when they planted the wheat seed, and they didn't have that stunted period. We'll talk more about that later. So, this. so what happens with the seed, when roots grow in the soil, there's a certain amount of phosphorus stored in the seed. But you can see a young emerging root doesn't have a lot of surface area, and there's just a little bit of soil contact with this young root. So what happens is that the seed amount of phosphorus is rapidly depleted, but the, the plant doesn't have enough of a root system 
to further its growth and get in this phosphorus uptake. So what the mycorrhiza does early on, if you can plant it early with your seed, is that you won't have this prolonged period of phosphorus depletion after the phosphorus in the seed is utilized, that they can, that those young root systems can start getting the hyphal development away from those primordial roots into the surrounding soil so they can access more of the phosphorus in the soil. And that's why we get better transplanting success with the mycorrhiza by having it in the soil just to encourage the rapid development of the mycorrhizal. It's good to use it early in your propagation mixes or with seeding. Yes? Sorry, if there's a QA afterwards, I can... I can no, I'm, I'm ready right here. Um, but it's just, almost like I planted you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering specifically about um, uh, how early inoculation... Like, you know, I understand the seed inoculation is the most common and that a lot of these like new blood products are now coming with some kind of, you know, like no charge. But I'm wondering, like, how essential is that? Is there a window that you can miss, or will they colonize whenever you stop seeding? So, the, it takes a while for the mycorrhiza to, to germinate and grow. So the propagules are dormant. So the plant puts out a chemical messenger. It's called formononenum, and it's a specific chemical to wake up any mycorrhiza propagules that are in the neighborhood. So the plant root, that, and then it happens pretty early. That happens like five to seven days after germination. You start, can, can start producing those compounds. But then it takes another seven to 10 days for the mycorrhizal propagule to start germinating to, and penetrate into the root and establish enough cortical cell activity where it can get sugars, where it can go out and grow. So you're talking two to three weeks to get the whole process going. So you just want an oculum you know, near where the roots are gonna emerge um, to keep, get that process activated as quickly as possible. But you know, occasionally like on a herbaceous, some aggressive grass species, we can get the mycorrhiza to go to seven, 10 days, but more likely it's two to three weeks to get the whole thing going. So, and, but that's enough to stop that phosphorus um, induced period where the plant just doesn't want to grow because there's not enough fruits there. So it helps some, but it doesn't eliminate the problem. Any other question? Yes. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I, I have to look at some of the stuff that I use on my product, and I use some of my stuff specifically for my mycorrhizae so in context of sugars. So the question is, uh, are there sugars that help the mycorrhiza or hurt the mycorrhiza when I'm using sugars laden flour, for example, or even things like fish hydrolysate or fish powder that people have told me benefit the mycorrhiza? Yeah, so there's, um, it's a very good question. And they're, the photosynthate that plants produce are specifically used to energize mycorrhizal activity in the soil. So they don't actually use the sugars that like a molasses would not be used by mycorrhizal fungi. It's got to be a plant produced photosynthate that enters the root and then enters the hyphae. But these other carbon based products produce a lot of other compounds which stimulate root exudates which gives more energy to the mycorrhizae. So it's more of an indirect effect. You're not directly supplying sugars for the mycorrhiza, but you're providing sugars which improve the flow of the photosynthate from the roots into the mycorrhiza. So a lot of carbon-based products really induce root activity and root hormones which stimulate mycorrhizal development. So a lot of these, and we'll talk about compatible products, but Fish is a great compatible, slow release nutrient source, stimulates a lot of biological activity and increases root exudates. Kelp's another one. Humic acids are another one. Worm castings. So we can go through all those. So <coughs> look at those that are produ producing more root activity, which is where the mycorrhizae gets there. And they have the benefit of not pushing, because with molasses you're going to push a lot of bacteria that's going to fight out the mycorrhizae. <coughs> Oh, you're saying that the bacteria are going to push out well, the mycorrhizae? Well, if, if I were to say that one of the reasons to use molasses, is, it, or what, one of the reasons not to use molasses is uh, to avoid a bacterial dominant field. Is that correct? Or is that uh, yeah, well, the, yeah. I don't think molasses eliminates mycorrhizal activity, but it does, it does definitely favor bacteria over fungi. But 
mycorrhizal fungi aren't a typical fungus that is living in the greater soil, bulk soil. Mycorrhizal fungi are stuck right, they're kind of the, the roots of the roots. So they don't depend on a lot of sugars in the soil the way these other fungi do. So they're probably less sensitive to things like molasses that would favor bacteria because they're directly plugged into the plant. <coughs> yes? A couple questions. Uh, would you recommend, uh, say, a granular or a wetable powder if you want to do inoculation? Um, and the next question is going to be, is there any worry about endo and ecto competing, say, in a bed? Would you, you know, and would you want to necessarily inoculate uh, ecto for maybe your cover crop? Well, ectos are for trees. So, only so trees. trees and oaks. So for a cannabis mix, you don't need any ectos. It's kind of an extra expense that's not going to get you any benefit. Um, in terms of when to apply, granular is probably your most economically beneficial because you just mix it into the propagation mix and you don't really have to worry about it. Uh, if you have an existing plant, it's good to have a soluble formulation that you can water into your soil. So it really depends more on the timing is which kind of product you use. They're both effective. And every time you add a soluble product to your growing root system, you do get a bump in growth and performance. So you can apply it every couple of weeks and continue to see, you'll see it like a week later, it's like, whoa, you know, you see that bump in performance because you're just bombarding the soil with all this new root activity and micro, micro, mycorrhizal activity. So, so you can reapply it. It's not going to hurt and usually it benefits because the, these big containerized mixes, there's so much soil in there. Anytime you can bombard the advancing root system with propagules, you get an enhanced effect. Yes? Um, would succulents uh, benefit from microbiome since they're so shallow rooting? Yeah, um, all desert plants form mycorrhiza. There are no exceptions. There are no desert plants that don't form mycorrhiza. And just because you don't see the roots out there, there's mycelium out there. I've inoculated palm trees all over the world, and including oil palms, and they have these really rudimentary root systems. But if you actually look, there are mycorrhizal hyphae a meter away <coughs> from those young root systems. Here. Anything that has really poor root systems, like some of these desert plants that just have a little bit of coarse roots, hmm. they are really dependent on mycorrhiza. Hmm. That's how we actually identify plant dependencies, is if they have a lot of coarse, if they have coarse roots, then they're even more dependent on mycorrhiza because you don't see the fine roots. So they're more dependent on their fungal components, yes. What's well, a better way to apply it? Uh, the powder right on the roots to transplanting or in a water solution as you water? I don't know. But I would, I would avoid coating the roots because sometimes you can have other effects if it like desiccates the roots kind of thing because some products, I'm not, this product is fine, but there are some products that have, that tend to desiccate the roots. So I would rather apply it as a solution, just as a general thing, because we, we make mycorrhiza for all mycorrhizal products. 95% of the products out there, we grow in mycorrhizae. So, um, and I don't know what some of these other manufacturers combine the material with. With these guys, it would be fine, but I wouldn't worry about just taking any mycorrhizal product off the shelf applying it as a dry powder because you could yeah. soak all the osmotic potential out of the roots. Okay. Yeah. Yes? So it's kind of for a question for you and Jeff, I want to ask him too for when he comes in, but it's about basically, it's kind of also regarding the question he had about when you're brewing teas, a lot of people use molasses. So I've read a lot of, you know, conflicting info basically regarding a uh, it can encourage a lot of bacterial growth at first, but then it can make your tea go anaerobic pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And so there's, I hear there's, you know, better food sources for it. Like not, you know, like as in like, I started using uh, AD, which is Aphrodite extraction from nectar from gods. And so, uh, Jeff, I, Jeff is really, he's a tea expert. Okay, so that's So yeah, he, he talks a lot about, it, he talks there. about a lot about teas in his steel, but I just, the saprophytic fungi are really different than the mycorrhizal fungi and they have entirely different nutritional needs. And so when you use molasses or the various tea components, 
you're really affecting the saprophytic fungi in the tea. There are no mycorrhizal fungi in teas. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. and they they're getting their their energy from the plant root from the plant. So okay. it's probably, as far as we know, not as big a factor of what you do. I think compost teas are really good for mycorrhizae. Well, me too. Like it was really crazy because I, I I did a test out in my my front yard. Right. I had a lot of weeds out there. Right. Dandelions really bad, and so I sprayed half of my yard with this compost tea and. I have some pictures of it because I was like, wow, this is really cool. I, I don't, I'm not sure what exactly happened down in the soil, I'd like to know, but in half the lawn there really isn't dandelions anymore. It's just lush, thick, really thick grass uh, where I applied the tea. And then on the other side is barren, kind of yucky looking. Weeds you know? love disturbed soils and no, no soil biology. They love that because the service knocks out the soil biology. Weeds love it. Um, and there's a lot of things in the literature about where a lot of the weeds are non mycorrhizal. So if you add mycorrhiza to a system, the mycorrhizal plants can outcompete the non mycorrhizal plants. And if you add mycorrhiza, the non mycorrhizal plants can't get phosphorus because the mycorrhiza tie it all up. And there's a dozen really good papers on that. How, and one of the things that we hear from farmers that use mycorrhiza is that. I can't believe my weed problem's gone because yeah. they can't. The the non mycorrhizal plants can't compete for resources. Well, I use mycorrhizae at the very end of my tea brew because it doesn't really, you know, last. Yeah, it's just in to the apply brew. it, just to get well, it in the soil. Yeah, just to put it in there. Yeah, and, right. uh, um, the other thing I noticed is around fairy rings. I'm sure you know what those are because it's that's a term I, I'm recently coming to terms with. So I'm like, wow, this is cool. But I noticed inside the fairy rings there is no weeds. In, in my yard, and I have some pictures of that too because I thought it was really cool. And I was wondering, does it have to do with the fun with the fungus? Well, the so, mycorrhizal fungus grow in a radiating pattern too, but the fairy ring fungus may or may not be a fairy ring fungus. It could be other ring fungi, including mycorrhizal fungi. Oh, fairy rings. okay. The fairy ring fungus is Merasmus aureates. It's a specific fungus, but there's really lots of fungus that grow in that dichotomous pattern that radiated out that way. Uh -huh. That's just the one that they gave a name because it's got that, uh, yeah, that ring of like, mushrooms that goes around. I wasn't it. sure if it was a real term. I just there's many, the many like, fungi oh, form fairy rings. That's okay. I was they really don't like, fruit the mushrooms really in that cool. pattern. So, but I was like, I, I gotta ask. It's funny, I mean, this, this group always asks the best questions. Last year I thought in that group. I get unique questions for this group. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have a question on phosphorus. Okay. I've been reading about the depletion of phosphorus for mining for NPK agriculture, and as we were talking about with mycelium, the partial uh, remediation for that, we would need to apply so much industrial phosphorus if what was there was better access. Yeah, I would say that you know on an annual basis, 10% of the phosphorus is accessed, so 90% is remains in the soil or gets washed away through erosion or leaching or whatever. So a lot of the phosphorus issues in the world are based on the fact that the soils are dead. And it's this living soil that mobilizes and absorbs and transports phosphorus back to the plant. So can we generate phosphorus back to the soil? Can what now? Can uh, living soil with beneficial mycelium regenerate some of that phosphorus? It doesn't regenerate it, it just dissolves it like that little phosphate rock I showed that most phosphorus are just little rocks in the soil so the more enzyme activity the more that rock gets dissolved but it doesn't add phosphorus it's not like a nitrogen fixing thing that you can take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and fix it in the soil so there is no mix phosphorus is it's a, it's like a fossil fuel it's like it's mined there's only so much phosphorus on the planet and depending on who you believe, it's like 50 to 100 years of phosphorus left. Most of the reserves are like Morocco. Uh, the United States will run out of phosphorus in about 20 years. The only mines I think still operating, there's one in Florida and one in South Carolina. And that's it, phosphorus for this country. We're gonna be importing phosphorus just like we used to import oil. I and mean, we're gonna be dependent on these other sources for phosphorus, you know. I can talk hours about phosphorus availability in the future. Well, we'll have to say something else that starts with the letter P. Which is? P. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can recycle it. They actually did a great thing in the Netherlands. There was this party, this big musical conference thing that they did, and they recycled all the 
the uh, urine from the from the music festival and made phosphorus fertilizer out of it. So cheap. And it was, was, right it was a lot of beer that's being that? drunk in the Netherlands because they got a lot. I forget how many tons of pee they got out of that. So you're right. Yeah, eventually people are going to be recycling. Phosphorus, mostly, probably, likely from animals rather than humans. But I thought that was pretty unique. Yes. Uh, is there, um, like, how when you were having the ecto problems and, you, and that guy told you about nature and get some sugar, but like, what kind of things, if I wanted that endo mycorrhiza, is it? Is it available to me? So the the endos don't produce fruity bodies. So the ectos, the tree ones, produce truffles, puffballs, and mushrooms. Yeah. And some of them are better at spore knocking than others. So it's pretty easy for trees to get a like David Aurora's book on mushrooms and fine yeah. puffballs, and just extract the puffballs and inoculate your own trees. For endos, and I have I have it on the microscope out there. For the endos. The spores don't come in a fruity body. They're individual spores in the soil. And so you can go out and sample 100 places and go for 100. Or you might find a nest of them, you know, out of some wild soil where you got them. But you won't know until you would extract them. Oh, okay. So it's pretty, it's pretty hit and miss. And if it's a, a tree dominated area, chances are you're not going to get any. You're going to use just ectos. But if you went out like into a native grassland out in the prairie soils, you'd probably get quite a bit. So if you had a native undisturbed prairie soil, you could probably get, just by going out there and grabbing some earth, get some inoculum. So it really depends on where you sampled and how undisturbed it was. But the native prairies were incredible. Yeah. And I've been in a redwood stand. You almost can't miss in a redwood stand too. It's been a lot of time looking for fungi. Yeah. Yeah. So the redwood <laughs> forests are really good. They're really good. Cool, man. Yes, in the back. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm given, on the soil disturbance from, I'm given to understand that one of the major arguments for using a living mulch is that it can preserve the mycelium network in between harvest and planting when you're doing multiple turnovers in a right. cycle or season or whatever. And I'm wondering if there are particular plants that um, are best for that. And I'm also just kind of generally curious about how the process works. When you transplant an inoculated plant into an area that you know has a mycelial network, like how do those connect? So there are green cover crops are an excellent way to maintain mycorrhizal populations. If you maintain the green cover, you would only need to inoculate once because they're going to be there. And by far the best plants to keep it going are clover and alfalfa. You learn a lot of trade secrets there. <laughs> but green covers are amazing. Uh, it's fabulous. And because uh, they keep the energy flowing into the soil, which keeps the mycorrhiza alive, so you don't need to re inoculate. You need to re inoculate because soils get disturbed, they get tilled, they get, you know, they use certain chemicals, fungicides that wipe them out. So if you didn't use that and you, kept, and you didn't have a fallow period, the mycorrhiza would just stay in place the way they have for millions of years. Huh. So it's how we manage the soil that's been eliminating these beneficial organisms. Yes? I'm just curious, Mike. Uh, Do you guys know Jack? This is one of the pioneers of down to earth. He is the pioneer of down to earth. But he's one of the pioneers of organic management in the Northwest and beyond, let me tell you. He's a living legend. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> now you're embarrassed. <laughs> Uh, I'm just curious, what kind of effect do you think uh, these forest fires have on mycorrhizal populations? Like say up, up near Multnomah Falls, where it's really, really intense. I think it hurt them. We actually did a bunch of research on that after the Silver Fire in 1987, and we looked mm -hmm. at different fire intensities and the effect. There was virtually no effect from a low intensity fire. Virtually no effect. Because the heating just went down a couple inches and the roots were deeper than that, and the inoculum stayed in place, and these things rapidly sprouted, the manzanita sprouted, everything came back really fast, and so they kept the soils alive. But the intense fires were the ones that were most affected, because they also eroded, yeah. things didn't come back as fast, you got weeds in there, you got non-mycorrhizal plants invaded, so it was the intense fires that are the problem. So I imagine they will have some problems, because yeah. so much of it was intensity, but most fires, I mean, most natural fires that burn is 10% is high intensity, 
20% is moderate intensity and 70% is low intensity. So it fills in pretty quick, but it's these areas is that they've done fire suppression for 200 years. When they burn, it's like 70% high intensity, which is kind of unnatural. But yeah, I imagine they're gonna have some problems. The ectos blow in, because they blow in the wind. So for the tree fungi, they tend to disseminate better, because they can blow larger distances. So the ecto, like the mushrooms and the puffball spores, they can fly miles. <coughs> but the endospores are so big, they don't blow in the wind, or very rarely blow in. It takes a hell of a wind to blow them around. So they wash around in water a little bit, chipmunk feet and deer and stuff like that. They can move around a little bit, but not like the ectos. Anybody else? Yes. Can you use mycorrhiza in conjunction with something like Lab, <coughs> um, EM1, or some of those other like KNF? Like that. I don't even know what any of those are. Uh, <laughs> EM1 is like, um, <clears throat> lab is uh, lactobacteria. Uh, like yeah. EM1's got lacto, like PNSBs, and some other, like yeast, stuff like that. Don't have, don't have any idea. Okay. Yeah. On the other front, flip side, really, uh, is there any products uh, that can enhance my So, for example, neem and grunge are unrelated, but for some reason they work better. Is there something that helps my horizon grow faster or bigger or stronger or anything? Anytime you add carbon to your soil, it's a good thing. Biochar. Biochar, uh, worm castings, humic acids, kelp, um, anything that adds carbon and any kind of that stimulates other biological activity, anything that stimulates root growth, stimulates mycorrhiza because that's their energy source. So, I mean, that's the stuff I've worked with. It doesn't so, have to be more specific than that, basically. Yeah, we actually used a lot of those things I just talked about to grow my career. So I know they work well. So, and that's actually what's in the book. A lot of those components are in the book fit product to enhance the mycorrhizal activity. Very good. So um, last year when I talked to this group, I realized how intelligent the audience was and so maybe thought, hmm. We go beyond the, some of the typical stuff and talk about how mycorrhiza fit into the, the larger picture of things, including soil structure and activity. Um, this is actually a great photograph because it shows the sticky nature of the mycorrhiza. See, here's the mycorrhizal threads. You see how the sand grains are stuck to the mycorrhizal thin uh, threads? And that's this glycoprotein. It's kind of a sticky, it's called glomalin. And it's a sticky substance that glues soil together. And you want good structure in your soil so the roots can penetrate into the soil and get the air and water into the soil, but also so you can access the nutrients in all these little tight, you know, tight, tight spots in soil. These blocky or platy structures is tough to the roots and the mycorrhiza to access the nutrients in the soil. So you want good granular soil and not massive, blocky, platy structures. What people don't realize is how much, and I've been working on this recently because I'm working on a book with the Rodale Press about this. They have this long-term trial. I'll show you some pictures of organic versus inorganic management in the, for 30 straight years in these soils at the Rodale Institute. And it's a fascinating data set, and we're finally getting into it. We're publishing it in Sustainable Ag in Germany. But um, there's as much carbon in the world's soil than all the atmosphere. There's three times as much carbon in soil than all the vegetation on Earth. So what separates out planet Earth from like Venus or Mars, and Venus and Mars, there's no mechanism from getting the carbon dioxide out of that atmosphere and into the plant, into a, an organic living system. And that's why they don't have life on those planets. Wherein, for some reason on planet Earth, we've evolved this ability to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and make it available as carbon for living things. And that's a big role that the mycorrhiza play. It was just in National Geographic last night, that's why I remembered. It's in the March edition, they talk about what makes Earth different. And it's fascinating, but the compound that mycorrhiza produces is guamal. It's what gives, one of the reasons soils have this rich dark color. And you can see after the extraction, you make the soil a lot less organic looking, et cetera. And it accounts for about 30% of the world's soil carbon is this, is this glomalin. And it's specific, specifically produced by mycorrhizal fungi. And the beauty of it is that 
Plants take CO2 out of the atmosphere and fix it as guamala. So you can add a lot of carbon out of the CO2 where it's a major reason for global warming and put it in the soil where it's going to enrich um, plant productivity. And that's, that's such a great opportunity. And you think, okay, well, where's the data? This is where this farming system trials comes in. In the, in the Rodale Institute trial, this is inorganic tilling versus mycorrhiza and no-tilling green manures. And they're averaging 1,000 pounds per acre per year of carbon in these soils they're adding. You start multiplying that by 170 million acres of farmland in the United States, it's like it takes care of like 60% of the CO2 increase per year for, on this planet. It's huge. It's a very rapid way to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it into the earth. It's a tremendous opportunity. Is it? Oh. I think the New York Times did an article on it yesterday. Jeff was telling me on soil, the solution for global warming. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. Did you see it yesterday? No, but I'm excited about it, and I feel like, you know, um, you know, why aren't we doing that in the Amazon or somewhere? What? And also my question is, does hemp actually sequester six times as much carbon as a tree? No. No? I've heard that. I don't know. I think the rate, the rate is per unit leaf area is pretty high for cannabis because it's a it's pretty it's like a C4 plant and how it works but I don't know I can't compare it to other things but I it's so productive I can't imagine it's productive but it doesn't it doesn't even come close to forest the highest tons per hectare ever recorded was in Prairie Creek Redwood Park in Navajo County but a lot of that's because the the forests have so much more biomass and leaf area but if you compare it per unit per unit meter of leaf area, yes. cannabis might be as productive. But it doesn't. Because like see, like corn and um, sunflowers and sorghum are super high in terms of their carbon acquisition in the soil. Those are three. If you want to maximize and you want to grow an annual plant, those would be the ones you use. But forests have so much canopy. The redwood forest has so much bio The greatest living biomass on Earth is Stout Grove. So it's got to have tremendous ability to fix its carbon per unit sky area, but per unit leaf area, I don't know. So Oregon's forest is pretty close up to that. And yeah. they're about, I don't order back to the Amazon. Well, yeah, there's yeah. more biomass in an Oregon forest than the Amazon. But if you just wanted to grow a crop to fix, to put carbon in the soil, Sorghum, sunflower, and corn. Well, let's do that. <laughs> well, we're working on it. All right. And we're going to publish this study. And like I say, the New York Times did the article on it yesterday. And there's been a lot of scientific articles. Again, the problem with the scientific articles is that they're unreadable. There's <laughs> <laughs> so much jargon. <laughs> produced by scientists. There's <laughs> <laughs> so much jargon. Great information, but who's going to read it? So. You know, we need to do stuff. We did. A, I did an article for Atlantic Magazine. Talked about Atlantic, the and Atlantic is pretty good general yeah. thing. Yeah. They made me tone it down quite a bit, but it was it was good. A lot of these I used a lot of these pictures in the article. So, um, yeah, this is, and you can produce like a, that thousand pounds per acre per year has gone on for 22 straight years. So it's not something that's just a one or two year deal. And we're hoping that, because glomalin breaks down in about 40 years, so we're hoping that we're going to continue to add at this level for at least 40 years. But that would be that would be great. And here's another issue: so the water quality issue. And you're going to love Jeff's talk. I'm wrapping up here, but uh, about 50% of the nitrogen that we use in these cornfields actually ends up in the corn. The rest ends up in the Mississippi and heading down to the Gulf of Mexico. And it creates these hypoxia zones where all the nutrients flood into the water and you get these tremendous algae blooms. This is Louisiana. You can see the hypoxia zone goes all the way from Florida to Mexico. It's about 10,000 square miles. And it's just extra nutrients, you know. And as the algae decomposes, it uses all the oxygen in the water. That oxygen in the water, you get this massive die off. <laughs> it's a terrible deal. And you know the fastest growing hypoxia zone? You would never guess. 
Yeah, off the <coughs> Columbia River. And it's the nurseries. It's horrible. Yeah. And once I started looking into how bad it was, it was shocking. It's growing, really. It's growing yeah, it super fast. Like it. It came out of nowhere. Production. But it's the nurseries, I think, right. you know. And that's what they're, they're tracing, the nurseries. Pretty much, the, people like Monrovia have already figured it out because they knew they were losing a lot of nutrients. And like every plant that Monrovia grows has mycorrhiza, and it's to reduce the nutrient oh, flow out of their containers, mm -hmm. you know, and out of their beds. So some people are proactive, other people are pretty, are fighting it, but they're gonna start monitoring. But obviously the mycorrhiza can get away from the roots, and, you know, less stuff is lost yeah. out of these containers. Huh. So that we won't yeah. talk, that's, but anyway, this is some data on our product. And here's the, full rate. The green areas are with mycorrhiza and the red areas are without mycorrhiza. It's the full rate of fertilizer. But we reduced the amount of nutrient loss out of the bottom of the pots from about 20 to 40 percent. So that was published in 2011. So we can, you know, we're not going to eliminate all leaching from nurseries and containerized, but 20 to 40 percent with one application of one product is a pretty good start. Yeah. And here's just, just, you know, an example of some of the data that went into that, these, this and other studies, but this is, these are lemon trees without and with mycorrhiza. This is uh, half the fertilization rate without and with mycorrhiza. And this is the full fertilization rate with and without mycorrhiza. And the beauty of this is you can see there's almost no difference between on the inoculated plants half or full rates of fertilizer. And we see this over and over again, people can cut the fertilization down 30 to 50 percent, no loss of productivity, because you get better efficiency. It was the original World Wide Web. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we're trying to create a mycorrhizal canopy with root systems below the ground, the way you would produce an above ground canopy. And a lot of people say, well, how come I haven't heard more about mycorrhizae? People are catching on. Yeah, so this is actually an organic with mycorrhizal plot at the national capital. And we did it on Michelle Obama's garden. We did the London Olympics. We do numerous. We did the fix the 49er field when it didn't take there. We were part of that, the fix there. And really all over the world we're doing stuff. Even Bill Gates tweeted, it may not sound appetizing, but this fungus could help feed the hungry. And then he used one of the pictures I had in that Atlantic article. <laughs> That's awesome. Is that legal for that? You should see the guy. <laughs> I do it. <laughs> I'm surprised he wasn't talking about vaccines. Yeah. <laughs> Don't bother this the guy's bro. So the other thing is that uh, Jack's company was down there, was one of the first companies to use mycorrhizal products. Uh, I think he started back in the 19. 94 or something, a long time. He was one of the first first believers, so I really thanked him for for his early adoption of that. But it's gotten a lot more popular, and really inoculant production was kind of pioneered in Oregon. This is actually uh, a col this is the active ingredient that's in these products, are these colonized roots. You can see the propagule, the spores within the roots and stuff, and we chop them up and put them in there. Huh. This is what they look like in an electron micrograph. So these are basically the seeds of the mycorrhizal fungus. And they have a long shelf life, a couple of years. So that's the active ingredient that goes in the product. And then when they get, when roots get active, the hyphae start popping out all over these root fragments and invade the nearest mycorrhizal root system. Started in my garage, uh, still my garage, <laughs> 30 years later. Um, then we grew to Grants Pass. We have this company called Mycorrhizal Applications, which I sold two years ago, but I think there are nine buildings in Grants Pass and have employed a lot of people. And then we built uh, plants in St. Louis, right across from Monsanto. Nice. <laughs> nice. In your face. And so we produce a lot of inoculum in these buildings. And we built another one because we couldn't, we wanted to supply Mycorrhizae are growing fast in Asia, and so we have a plant that we built in India. So we're being sold in 40 countries now. Wow. So it's neat to see a cottage industry in Grants Pass 
you know, produce millions of pounds of inoculum now. It's pretty cool. Thank God for Jack, because he was the only reason we were able to pull, pay the bills the first four or five years. <laughs> <laughs> we paid you, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, you were late, but you paid. No, no, they were always like, okay. That's enough. But uh, the, uh, I just, uh, just a sort of a, for like Constant Gardner and the Bigfoot guys, you really need more than just a good active mycorrhizal propagule. You really need to formulate it right collect, so it's easy to use. Uh, it's compatible with other ingredients in the products. And you need technical support. So the longer I've been in this, the more I realize, okay, it's one thing to produce a good, you know, inoculum, but you really need help. You need help from people that can communicate, educate, know how the stuff uses, knows when you ask technical questions can give people answers that help them with their growing operations. And that's and that's what you get at this at this institution and I think that's what you get with these products. So Bigfoot has a lot of the things that we talked about that we use to grow the mycorrhiza that we actually put in the product to help stimulate the mycorrhiza to grow. It's got kelp, micronutrients which we very rarely replace in soils that soils need, worm castings, humic acid and biochar. And I can talk about biochar for the whole for a whole century. It's such a fascinating product. It's so great for the mycorrhiza. The idea is to produce the healthiest soil for you guys. Um, just some of the benefits of these two different ingredients. And I want to wrap up here because I know Jeff one needs to go on. Jeff's off. excited. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea in 1979, James Lovelock published this book, The A New Look of Life on Earth. And he said, you know, why can't we make human activities into constructive and cooperative ecosystem behavior? And I really think that's such a possibility where instead of degrading soils, our growing practices can improve soils if we do it right. And what an exciting opportunity that is, is to grow products that people need, but do it in a way that enhances soils instead of degraded soils. And I think we know enough now to do that. We just need everybody to get on board. With that, I'm going to quit and let Jeff get, get on, and um, we'll just take it from there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, that was fun. I sure appreciate you watching that whole thing. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, found that informative. The Jeff Lowenfels one coming up probably tomorrow or the next day. Watch that one, and uh, I'll see you later. I love you. The OCG Fam Show, it's pretty good, it happens every day. It's the OCG Fam Show. See you tomorrow.